In 1997, Nokia released the very successful Snake, which was pre-installed on most mobile devices manufactured by Nokia. Since then, it has become one of the most popular games found on more than 350 million devices worldwide. Snake is said to have ushered in a new era of mobile games, but it was the second edition of the game in the year 2000 that became a household name. Snake 2 was launched with the Nokia 3310 and became an obsession for an entire generation. The snake is no longer just a line, it has an appropriate shape, a reward system and instead of colliding, it passes through the edges of the screen and returns to the opposite side. In India and around the world, whether it's lying in bed pretending to study in class or sitting in a cafe, children are fascinated and enthusiastically competing for the highest score. Snake is believed to have ushered in a new era of mobile gaming, an industry with an annual revenue estimated to a average 100 billion US dollars. With the advancement of computer technology, graphics, game engines and mobile phone hardware, today's mobile gaming industry provides an unlimited library of games within the reach of your pockets. But PUBG, Candy Crush, Flappy Bird and many other popular games owe it all to a moving pixelated reptile sliding on a 2-inch screen. May 2013 Vietnamese game developer Don Win released a new game to the App Store. It was just one of the hundreds of apps added to the app marketplace each day. In that way, it was just another game, but it would shake the whole mobile gaming world. Win has created a simple game in which the player controls a funny looking bird by tapping the screen, with the goal being to avoid eating randomly spawning pipes as well as the ground, whilst trying to achieve a high score. Perhaps you've heard of it and most likely even played it. Months after release Flappy Bird, it shot to the top of the charts to join even more players, which made it even more popular and just like the spread of wildfire, millions of people were downloading Flappy Bird at its peak and Wing was raking in a staggering $50,000 a day from adverts that appeared during gameplay. All thanks to its addictiveness of course, so addictive fans began writing hilarious 5 star reviews claiming the game was ruining their lives. This game is life ruiningly addictive, I haven't slept. I used to sleep like a baby, now I can't, said one of the countless similar reviews. You see, the higher the retention, the higher the profits. In other words, the more time you can keep users playing your game, the more ads they watch or interact with and towards the more money you make. Over the coming months, Flappy Bird would face lots of critics. Flappy Bird isn't a good video game, it's arguably not even a fun one, popular video game review site IGN said. In a tweet, Wayne stated press people were overrating the success of his games, further adding it was something he never wanted, which I totally agree with. Just like every small indie game developer, he just wanted to put a game out there for people to play and at least make a couple bucks out of it. But as you have it, he was met with unplanned fame. Another media site Kotaku posted an article headlined Flappy Bird was making $50,000 a day of ripped artwork, further accusing Wing of copying and pasting Nintendo sprites into his game, later proved to be untrue and with Kotaku eventually retracting the article and apologizing. I mean, quite a funny thing to say considering the world where we're living now where nothing is really original, just basically a tweaked or spiced up version of a pre-existing idea. With all the drama, media hate and madness, this eventually led to Wayne getting rid of the game from the App Store. And that was the end of Floppy Bird, or at least the original Floppy Bird. Multiple cloned and ripped off versions of the game began to pop up. We'll get to this later in the video. Just a week after the strange Flappy Bird app soared to popularity, it's now been removed from the app stores by its creator. The game hit the top of the charts for iTunes and Google Play. There's Flappy Pig in the Google Play Store, there's Flappy Fish on Windows, and Flappy Bee on the iPhone. There's even a mock one that you can play on the desktop. It's called Flappy Doge, themed after the internet meme. Many pipes such as Sweet. April 2012 came the true definition of addictive, meets Candy Crush. I can bet my dollar that you've played this game or have come across someone playing it. If you haven't heard or played Candy Crush, high chance your cave person will happen to stumble on this video. Damn. Released in 2012 by game developer and publisher King, Candy Crush is still by far the most popular mobile game in the world right now. Unlike Flappy Bird which was in no way planned to be addictive, the reverse can be said for Candy Crush, the greatest bottom killer of all time, carefully engineered to hook players to the very core. According to the market analyst Sensor Tower, players of the Candy Crush game spent an average of $4.2 million per day in 2018, up 6.5% from the year 2017, 
also raking in 230 million new players in 2018 a 17% increase over 2017 and that number only kept going up, grossing in a massive $2 billion in lifetime revenue in the year 2019. But what makes Candy Crush so addictive? This leads us to the field of neuroscience. You see, addiction is based around the pleasure center or reward system of our brain, which is controlled and regulated by a neurotransmitter called dopamine. When we do something that activates the reward center, dopamine is released, which gives us a little high or euphoria. Ignoring the colorful and mesmerizing user interface, designed to be attractive so that it draw you in, Sweet. as well as the hypnotic sound effect, both of which of course plays a huge role. Candy Crush rewards you with goals so you feel good about yourself. The designers of these games create moving goals or new objectives that get progressively harder. So just when you reach one, there's another giving you a false sense of there being an ultimate goal. You beat a level, your brain gives you a nice shot of dopamine, which makes you want to keep going. And this is a trait shared by several addictive games. And as I stated earlier, the higher the player retention, the higher the profit made out of in-game adverts viewed and products bought. A boss of which usually rewards the player with some sort of virtual currency, which can be exchanged for unlocking items such as power-ups, cool costumes or even level progression depending on the theme of the game. By the end of 2019, the global mobile gaming market was estimated to be worth over $68.5 billion, with lots of investors buying in. Citing this money-making opportunity, the number of mobile games rose rapidly across the years, turning the mobile gaming industry into a competitive battleground. Talking of battleground, March 2017, player unknown battleground or PUBG for short was born. The idea for PUBG was come about by Irish game designer Brandon Green. Green would create popular mods of shooter games played and enjoyed by game streamers around the globe. All this which would later lead him to propose the idea of a last man standing shooter experience to South Korean game company Blue O, acquiring their interest. The idea for PUBG was pretty simple, as many as 100 online players would parachute into an island. On landing, they would explore for items to stay alive and weapons to protect themselves. To maintain a faster pace, the size of the island would shrink every couple of minutes, drawing players closer together until there's only one left. With the year getting closer to an end, PUBG had already seen huge success, acquiring approximately 20 million downloads. In late 2017, Bluehole made an official release to mobile, and ever since then, PUBG has seen an overwhelming growth in players becoming a major global hit, reaching over 1 billion downloads worldwide and grossing in close to $700 million just in the first quarter of 2020. Most of the revenue generated from virtual currencies, costumes and special items that players could purchase using actual real money. Starting mid-2018, the mobile game genre, hypercasuals began to grow in popularity. Hypercasual games were lightweight, simple in gameplay mechanics required minimal design and usually free to play, with loads of disruptive in-game ads of course, which players could remove by paying a certain amount. They were easy to play but highly addictive, so addictive that according to Sensor Tower in 2020, hyper-casual games on mobile were responsible for a third of global downloads, or 6.3 billion, with Voodoo, game publisher and developer behind the games, Scribble Rider and Aquapark.io to name a few taking the lead in the third quarter of 2020, a company now valued at over $1 billion, with companies like Tencent and Goldman Sachs being minority shareholders. 2020, the whole world was hit by the pandemic. People were stuck at home in quarantine with most jobs switching to remotes, leaving individuals with nothing to turn to for entertainment besides their mobile phones. Everyone wanted to feel and to stay connected with friends and families, causing a rise in the use of social media apps and not surprisingly a skyrocketing increase in mobile game users and time spent playing these games daily, most especially online multiplayer and hypercasuals. In the fourth quarter of 2020, small indie game developer Inner Slot would meet unexpected fame and success with the game Among Us. Today, me and the boys will be playing Among Us with Sapnap, Dream, and George. An online multiplayer released back in 2018, a game that allowed 4 to 10 friends or strangers to play as tiny colorful characters preparing for departure in a spaceship. 
while everyone else is a crew mate, a couple of players are made imposters, with the job being to kill crew members and sabotage the ship. Thanks to the pandemic and a bunch of Twitch streamers, Among Us saw a huge surge in players out of the blues, reaching more than 100 million downloads on mobile and raking in over 18 million dollars in revenue, with the US accounting for over 50 million dollars of total spend. People were isolated and wanted to feel connected during the pandemic, and Among Us did just that. On iOS, customers downloaded about 2.6 billion games in the third quarter of 2020. The number of game downloads on Google Play increased by 20% year on year, reaching approximately 11 million downloads in the third quarter of 2020, accounting for nearly 8 of the 10 games downloaded from the App Store, with Chinese based tech holding company Tencent soaring to the top. Tencent's international game revenue almost doubled over the year to a whopping $1.5 billion. But not just game developers and publishers are cashing out big money, so is Google and Apple, the owners of the app stores of which these games are published to. Google and Apple are known to handle all financial transactions made by players or users. Simply put, when a player downloads a game from the Google Play Store and purchases an in-game product, for every transaction made or money paid, Google takes a smaller cut, giving the remaining larger portion to the publisher or developer. In 2020 alone, the digital content platform Google Play generated gross revenues of nearly 40 billion US dollars and more than 64 billion US dollars by Apple's App Store, all through mobile apps and games revenue share. So you've uncovered this gold mine and you want to have a fetch of this sweet, sweet gold. I need to make my own mobile game, you say to yourself. You come up with an idea for a game, you download the game engine of your choice and get to work. You proceed in learning or mastering the tools, crafting your game, and finally, after months or even years of hard work as a game developer, your ads, I mean your game, is ready to be shown to and played by people all around the world. You go ahead and self-publish your game in a marketplace filled with millions of other games, with thousands of new titles being published each day, and in this vast never-ending ocean of mobile games, the probability of your game being discovered becomes significantly low. And if you can't rake in players, you can't rake in any profit. All the hard work can't be for nothing. You need a way to create awareness, show your game to an audience, make them want to install and play it. Marketing, of course running adverts, displaying gameplay previews and trailers, with the end goal of luring in a user base of players. In 2020 alone, Google Ads revenue amounted to 146.92 billion US dollars. This stunning amount generated through its Google Ads platform, which enables advertisers like game developers and publishers to display ads, product listings and service offerings across Google's extensive ad network to target users. But sadly, you have no change of money left from producing your game, or in most cases of small indie game developers, little or no budget to begin with, so what do you do to market your game? And that's where mobile game publishers came in. Show us your game, if we like it, which is another word for, if it's fun, super addictive and nothing as we've seen before, then it has a high potential of making us lots of money, then we are willing to cover the cost of marketing. In return, we give you a certain percentage of the profit your game, I mean our game, makes either monthly or annually. Think of it as an investment, a venture capitalist will provide funds or capital to a company with higher growth potential in exchange for an equity stake. The same goes for mobile game publishers. Without a publisher, most indie game developers are left to source other means, with the most common being crowdfunding. In 2020, video games developers raised a total of $23.3 million on the popular crowdfunding site Kickstarter, a number that's pretty small compared to the number of game projects out there and the amount spent by big studios to make a single game, with mid-level games averaging around $20,000 to $100,000 to develop, not to include marketing which usually costs as much as the development budget. When a game developer have their game rejected by a publisher and have found no success in crowdfunding, what happens? They rely on organic search discoveries and hopefully that the store's algorithm recommends the game to users, which in few cases work if proper app store optimization is done, and in most cases not. In fact, a study shows a large percentage of indie games fail due to factors ranging from no marketing due to unavailability of funds to lack of originality. Talking of originality, what happens when you can't come up with an original game idea, but you want to make some fast gold nuggets? 
Well, you make an exact clone or ripoff of a popular or original game into the world of mobile game clones. Developers with no game idea in mind but were looking to make quick bucks would go on sites like SellMyApp.com, a platform known for selling templates of popular mobile games, which can be easily reskinned or edited using the specified game engine. These developers or individuals then proceed in placing their in-game ads and products and publishing to the App Store, with a name or metadata similar to the original. This act got so rampant, leading to Apple instituting new tougher review guidelines against clone and scam apps, stating apps created from a commercialized template or app generation services will be rejected, cleaning up millions of apps from its store in the process. Similar action never happened with the Google Play Store. The game industry in general has become the biggest industry in the world, exceeding the revenue generated by the music and movie industry. And with the introduction of new technologies such as 5G, recent advancement in the fields of mobile, virtual and augmented reality, mobile devices with more graphics and hardware capabilities, the growth is only going to keep on rising, with the global mobile gaming market expected to reach an estimated $153.5 billion by the year 2027. All the big shocks are in it now, and many companies that were never into gaming will join in over the coming years. Over 50% of indie games never make more than $4,000 in lifetime revenue. These games never generate enough revenue to cover the development time and other costs, with as small as 1% of indie games making over $7 million in revenue. But the whole idea of going indie doesn't have to be discouraging. Thanks to modern age of technology with platforms like YouTube, Twitch and TikTok, where anyone can become star or so-called influencer, these platforms can be utilized to your advantage. We're talking cheap or even free marketing at your disposal. But in the end, it all comes down to giving players the very best experience. Putting in a lot of effort, making a really good game if not original, then close to original, a game people can connect with and would love. Raking a few audiences with the little funds you managed to raise and watch them do the work of spreading your game to your wider audience. The sweet sweet profits becomes the end result. Alas, success. Hey, wow, you still here? Thanks for watching this video to the end. Looking at my previous videos, I mainly make tutorials, but I decided to switch things up. This time, I wanted to do something different. So, starting today, my channel is probably gonna be a blend of game dev and finance topics. But anyways, if you made it to the end, I appreciate you. Hit that like button as a lot of sweat went into making this video. Literally. Here in Africa, we don't have electricity. I live in a hut with a 2010 Windows 7 computer and a 200 KB per second internet connection. Just kidding. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and I'll see you in the next video.